Today on Global Value Creators, we are delighted to welcome Stephen Garvey, co-founder and CEO of Glenvay Properties, one of the largest home builders in Ireland. Stephen started building in his early 20s, successfully scaling his dad's contracting business before launching Bridgedale Homes in 2003. In 2017, he partnered with global asset manager Oaktree, merging Bridgedale into Glenvay. Now, Stephen is laser-focused on dominating the Irish housing market by disrupting the traditional business model, including building his own drone department. We hope you enjoy. Let's take it from the beginning, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you were born in Ireland, I suppose, and fill us in from there. Yeah, so um, uh, I suppose uh, my visual act won't tell you my true age. Um, I'm about 40, I'm 41 years of age. Uh, I've been in the construction industry for, for almost 20 years at this stage. Um, I suppose I was an early school leaver, uh, and my dad said two things. If you want to go out and work for yourself, uh, you better get a job quickly and uh, pretty much put me out in a construction site at a young age. Um, my dad had a small business. Um, he was a subcontractor. Um, pretty much from that stage then, I suppose, I seen where, where we could change things. And I suppose I asked my dad, there was only four of us working together at the time. I said, look, could I take it over uh, or, or, or make a few improvements, I suppose, was the way I pushed it. And in fairness to him, he let me, and I suppose I, I, I grew it quite rapidly from there. I scaled it up to about 100 people within about two to three years. And I suppose I, I stayed a subcontractor in the construction industry for probably up to about 25, 26. And obviously in 2003, then I formed Bridgedale Homes um, and grew a house building business from there. Um, I suppose I'd learned a lot of things being a subcontractor. Uh, I'd worked with a, a lot of the major contractors um, the house builders in the country at the time. And I suppose Ireland was going through uh, a phenomenal period. We had the thing called the Celtic Tiger, probably lasted from about 96 up to all the way up to 2007. And I suppose what that was, it was really my generation. We, we christened our generation, the Pope's generation. Um, uh, the Pope came here in, in 1979 and a lot of people were born, a lot of children were born at that point in time. Um, and that generation had come true. And I suppose they were the big driver of the economy overall. Um, so in 2003, I set up Bridgedale with another uh, colleague of mine, um, and I suppose we concentrated on small sites to start, you know, delivering a number of units throughout the year. It was very much a hands-on approach, you know, controlling everything, managing costs, but also learning the skill set of building homes directly ourselves. Um, and we did that up to about 2006. Um, and I suppose in 2006, um, we looked at the overall market, and, and I suppose the thing that stuck out to us was, um, things had slightly got out of control. Um, the inflation that was in house price and the inflation that was in the land market didn't make sense. Um, it was very much debt fueled. Um, and I suppose we started to deleverage at that stage. We started to reduce our assets across the board. Um, I had no idea how bad it was going to get. I thought it was just an Irish phenomenon. I suppose what really woke me up was I went to New York in uh, November 2008, and I know Lehman's had cla collapsed at that time, but I remember watching Citigroup and their share price going down and down. I said, the world is about to change and change bad. Um, so I suppose we came, I came home and I suppose I looked at our book and I said, look, we need to get out of this as quickly as possible. And our attitude was, you know, move assets as quickly as possible. Um, and we did that. And in fairness, we were working with RBS, who was our main bank at the time. Um, they, they obviously were in retrenchment mode. So, you know, RBS would have been exposed to a lot of international markets, but naturally enough, they had to retrench their own national market. They were being forced by governments. Um, so they simply didn't have the capital to lend. And anyone that came in with a good proposal, it just got shot down with immediate effect. Um, but we traded our way through the whole crisis. Ironically, we built more houses uh, out of the crash than we did into the crash. Um, we kept the workforce together. Um, you know, it was very difficult times here in Ireland up to 2010, 2011. Obviously, the IMF came into Ireland in 2011. Um, pretty much an austerity package was introduced of about 70 million euros, um, which was quite draconian on the entire economy. But I suppose one thing for Ireland was it accepted its pain early. It knew what it had to do. It knew to a certain degree, and I suppose the public embraced it was, they had a certain responsibility in this and they had a responsibility to take the country out of the mess it was in. So I suppose everyone rode in. Um, you could see things turning better around 2012. Um, we were starting smaller developments. Um, 
we we bought one off RBS. They were they were basically selling off their developments. They financed us on some of them. We finished them out. We we did profit shares with them. Um, but but they were retrenching, and and the Irish banks obviously were in a were in a complete shutdown at that stage. Um, so I suppose that roll on two thousand and fourteen, and and how things moved from there was I suppose. Uh, I we were looking for for capital. There was none simply on the ground. It didn't exist. If you smoke, if you spoke to a domestic investor, they literally said, "Look, don't believe in this residential thing. Not for me. Uh, I've seen where the country has gone." Um, so it was really international markets you had to look to. And I suppose that from there, I kind of met Justin. Uh, we met one day in a room um, that was set up by someone said, look, it'd be very good for you two parties to meet. I had no idea who Justin was and Justin had no idea who I was. Um, but I, I quickly learned who Oak Tree was and he quickly learned who Bridgedale was. Um, so I suppose there was a coming together. I know Oak Tree wanted to invest in Ireland. Um, we seen that we needed international capital to do it. Um, and I suppose from there, we kind of set this, the, 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 the whole thing in motion of, of scaling up. Um, I suppose there was no real outline at the stay at the first part of where this would go. It was a case of, and like all private equity, invest for a period of time and then monetize. Um, but I suppose the story evolved and we could see things on the ground that, look, there was a big opportunity to create a house builder here. Um, and I suppose it was going about that and setting setting the seeds in place to grow a business properly. And I suppose we brought it to full fruition in 2017 by by bringing it to the stock exchange. Um, and we raised 550 million in the initial raise. And um, yeah, the story is from there, as they say. No, that, that's great. We'll get we'll get more into it. That was a great uh, overview. I guess maybe you could talk just a bit about what you learned. You, you mentioned you had 20 years of experience working with your father yeah. as, a, as doing subcontracting even before Bridgedale. Maybe what was one of the big takeaways from from building that sub or helping to build that subcontracting business with your dad? Yeah, so my dad obviously he, he like all fathers are set in their ways and he had a way of doing things. Um, you know, he would always, and in fairness to him, he would instill this to me like he'd never let me walk away from you know shoddy work or anything like that. He says, just because someone else can do it that way doesn't mean you can do it. And I, I always remember that, and it always kind of stood to me. Um, I thought that was a great, you know, as the years moved on, I suppose when I was 16 or 17, I couldn't see the value of it. But when I was older, I could really see what he meant. And I suppose that was that was something that always stuck with me. Um, I suppose I seen things differently in the sense of, you know, I seen house builders who went out and the ways they built sometimes didn't make sense to me. The ways they, they, their build programs were aligned, how they set up their sites. A lot of those things I used to scratch my head and wonder, is this the most efficient system? Is there not a pile of money being, money being wasted? But I suppose you had to look from the context of where they were. The majority of house builders in Ireland at that time were all privately controlled own uh, companies. Um, they were debt fueled to a certain degree, um, predominantly by the Irish banks. Um, money was coming in quite freely and all they wanted to do was just, you know, invest, invest and, and, and worry about it down the road. So I, see, I suppose I could see, you know, this, this wasn't possibly the ways you could do things. You could do different, different things. Um, one thing I always noticed was we'd go in and do a show house launch at a weekend and we might sell, say, 50, 60, 100 units. And then we go like no tomorrow to build those 50, 60, 100 units in, in breakneck speed. And I always scratch my head. It says, what if we sold them in tranches of 20, built the 20 and go with the next 20? Um, I thought it was a very strange philosophy. And I thought, you know, what if you built half the houses and maximize the profit you could get at the other side? Um, so sometimes I thought we were a bit busy for the sake of being busy. Um, I thought there was a better way of doing it. Um, so things like that, I thought, you know, certainly the philosophy in house building, and, and it was one thing that stuck with me was, it was an industry that was extremely slow to change. Um, it would not adapt to new ways. It would not adapt to technology. Um, and not that I was the most IT savvy person myself, but I just thought it was always the same ways of doing the same things. And um, there was no belief in doing things differently. Um, so I kind of came to it that philosophy, you could do things differently. You could be more efficient how you'd use your money. You could be more efficient how you built your product, but also by embracing technology, it could streamline the process. Um, and I think you're seeing that in the sector across the board, like the productivity and construction is on the floor. But I suppose that's where the huge opportunity is to improve that and bring the sector along. And I think there's a, there's, there's a minimal amount of players out there who actually believe in this. They believe in doing the same things day in, day out, um, and they don't believe in embracing that. But I think that's something that we really embrace here. 
Um, I think it's something that goes through the business. Um, you know, all, all the people in this business pretty much will be of the same culture as myself that, you know, we have to adapt to new toxic. There is a better way of doing it. And to a better degree, we become the, the disruptors across the, across the, the business. Yeah. And we're going to talk about, I want to delve into that a lot uh, in just a minute. Um, no, that, that's, that's terrific. Um, I, I guess maybe, and it sort of, I guess, leads into the next question. What prompted you to strike out if I, on your own, I guess, with Bridgedale, if I understand correctly, that was different than your, your father's business. Maybe you could just talk about what gave you that sort of spark to go do your own thing, or maybe you yeah. just answered it. Yeah, I suppose my dad, like he was very, very much set in his ways. Um, he was a great tradesman, um, but he could only bring it so far. And, and that's where he always had ambition to bring it further, but he just never would would take the final step. And I suppose that's something I've been always very comfortable with. Taking the next step never has really bothered me. Happy to lean into something. Um, and yes, it will go wrong sometime, but but you have to take that, that risk to see how it goes. And I suppose I was always saw of the benefit. I was so young at the time. Um, I was doing really well for myself. I'd made, you know, really, really decent money. Um, so I had no fear. Um, and I suppose when we struck out, we kind of said, look, this is an opportunity. We had an ambition to become the biggest or anything like that. But it was, we've worked for these people. This is not that complicated. Let's just go and try and do it. And I suppose that was, that was definitely the way our attitude was. No, that, that's great. Um, and, and that leads us, I, I guess, into the next question. I, I was talking, um, we, you were talking about the 2008, 2009 when you came to New York. And, and I, I guess I, I'm sure like everyone, we, we learned a whole bunch of lessons during that period. But, but maybe what, what, what was the key lesson that you took out of that crisis, I would say, in terms of how you operate your business uh, now? Yeah, I think one thing, never take anything for granted um, was definitely one thing. Um, I think that the everything that you have to look at it, every action has reaction. Um, and it was amazing the snowball effect of how everything was crumbling and how it had the knock-on contagion into everything else. Um, that was the astonishing thing. Um, I think it was easy, and like, like everything in hindsight, looking back on something, you could really see the faults of things. But I suppose the thing for me was, uh, how badly people had got exposed um, and including ourselves, we were slightly exposed as well, but not as bad as others. Um, you know, not, don't take everything for granted was the big thing that I always, you know, you have to delve into the detail. You have to understand um, and that was the big thing. Um, but like everything, in every crisis, it creates opportunities as well. And I suppose the one thing that stuck out to me is as bad as it looked at that point in time in 2008 and 2009, there was going to be opportunity on the other side. And I suppose the big thing that stuck out to me was the old way of doing things and the generation that had delivered on that was probably going to be wiped out to that financial crisis. And, you know, it stuck out to me that once I got home and I realized how bad house prices potentially were going to fall and how bad it would get, you knew everyone was going to be wiped out. And I suppose what stuck out to me was, here's the opportunity. Things have to change now and there will be demand for housing into the future. But the people who were there to do it are now going to be gone. And I suppose that's, that's the ways I came out of that, thinking of that. And, and, you know, I look at that every day as, Everything is going to be that opportunity, same as other things that are happening across the globe today. Yeah, seeing the opportunity rather than the gloom and doom um, yeah. the coming out of that. Uh, you, you talked about how you met Justin in a room, I guess, that someone arranged. Maybe, maybe you could just give us a bit more um, thoughts or a bit more thinking on, on that meeting. Um, I, I guess also what attracted Oak Tree uh, beyond just meeting you? What, what do you think? I mean, uh, why were they attracted to Bridgedale uh, after I'm sure those initial discussions? Uh, obviously, Oak Tree is a, a massive hundred plus billion dollar firm and, and uh, yeah. You were a smaller Irish builder, let's say. So yeah. maybe you could just yeah. give us some insight into that yeah. meeting and, and sort of the, how the relationship was built. Yeah. And it was very interesting. So I, I, was, I was called on a Thursday and said, look, it was by an agent in Dublin and just asked me, look, this, this, this counterparty has been in with them. Um, and this agent obviously seen us as, you know, being boots on the ground. We had a good knowledge of things. We were doing quite well. Um, I suppose we were attractive. We were a much younger company. Um, and they said, look, this would be an interesting meeting. And they just gave me the name of the person and, and the company. And I had no idea who this was, never heard of them before um, and hadn't paid much attention. Of course, when you start to put it into Google, you start to say, OK, right, what am I going in for here? And I knew they wanted to look at one particular asset. Um, 
they had a big interest in one particular asset. And I knew a little bit about it. Now, it was a substantial asset. I wouldn't have been involved in it. But interestingly was, I knew it was in one of the, the, the banks that had a, a massive exposure to it. Um, and I understood it a bit. And I suppose when I went into the meeting, I understood everything about the asset. And when they just asked me about it, I was able to give them a full debrief. And I suppose the way as I summarized it is, if I was you, I wouldn't bother spending my money in here. You're going to be stuck in it for years. And they kind of took back and said, Jesus, that's a bit strange. Um, and that, that was just a fair assumption. I said, these are the conundrums you are not going to get over anytime soon and you're going to be looking. And I said, there's much better opportunities out there. Um, and I suppose it was just, it was, uh, uh, you know, in fairness to the Oak Tree guys, they do this day in, day out. They meet lots of people. Um, what they found very interesting was I had a different view of things and I thought about a lot of things. And interestingly, I suppose they said, I had said something about IRR and I think I'd, I'd related the asset to the weight of IRR or something. And they said, that's the first time they ever heard a house builder talk about IRR. And I says, well, that's how you're going to evaluate it in the end of the day. So why don't you get to the crunch? Does it work or does it not? Um, and they were kind of taken a bit back at by, and, and in fairness to Justin, he had a colleague at the meeting. And I suppose we rambled on for probably an hour and a half and I talked about different things and, 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 and things that I'd seen and stuff like that. And I suppose I talked about where I thought the future would go and how things would pan out. And to be genuine about it, I only thought it was going to be an hour and a half meeting. I'd move on and they'd move on, things like that. But Justin followed up with me then about a few days after. He says, look, I'd like to meet you again. Um, and we did. We followed up. In fairness to Justin, he spent a lot of time in Ireland. He had pretty much been investing he had tried to come in in about 2009 with Goldman Sachs to invest in, uh, in, in McInerney's, which was the last PLC that had been in Ireland. They had a heavy exposure in the UK as well. And he tried to do that deal, but unfortunately he wasn't able to get it done because the Irish banks, the Irish banks were already going to get paid because NAMA had been set up. So they were guaranteed a, a certain sense in the dollar no matter what. So if you couldn't outdo that, there was no point in negotiating it. Um, so, yeah, he'd been a bit, a bit disappointed. He really wanted to get into Ireland. He'd seen it on two fronts. He really wanted to play the commercial space and the office space. He had seen how IT had evolved, how Ireland had started to become attractive, um, and he'd seen this as a potential opportunity there. And then, obviously, he had a long-term ambition on, on the residential sector. He really liked it. And they were trying to do it in the UK. You know, they had a lot of platforms on the go in the UK. They had Ontology in London, and then the Pegasus Life that was more a, a retirement living thing. And there was a lot of crossover there. Um, so he liked the space. So I suppose we probably, to a degree, I describe it, we dated for about four or five months. Um, and then one day I was asked, look, would you come over to London? Uh, we, I'd like you to meet the team. And, and Justin's boss was there. Uh, an eccentric character, I have to say. Um, and I hit it off with him uh, kind of pretty early. And he bought into the whole philosophy of what we're doing. And I suppose they committed to putting 100 million into Ireland. Not true how they wanted it, not sure how they wanted it in the end of the day, what was the long term, but they could see the immediate future. And I suppose that was something that they wanted to capture pretty quickly. So I suppose we struck a partnership. We would, we would manage the assets for them. They would invest. Uh, we would match some of the capital across the board. Um, that we couldn't match to what they could. We were, we were never going to have the same checkbook. But, but it was interesting. And I suppose we had a fair assumption of what we wanted to do and what they wanted to do. And then obviously as things evolved and, and you know, Justin, obviously his timeline in Oak Tree, he'd done 12 years when he left it. Um, as he would say, he had done enough at that stage. Um, and, and he wanted to see what the rest of the world looked like. And I suppose, you know, floating Glen Vey was a big opportunity for him. You know, engaging with the international community, the international investors. He had seen companies do it, but he'd never done it for himself to a certain degree. So, and in fairness to him, that's where his real skill set was. It was actually talking to other investors. Um, his lawyer background easily lent to, to working out prospectus and bringing lawyers to, to the to fore. And he found that very comfortable. Whereas, and I suppose what it helped me was it freed up my time then to concentrate on actually growing the business and concentrating on all those things. But, you know, at a point in time, we all both knew Justin was the lawyer, I was the builder. Uh, he'd always say to me, I don't really know how to lay the bricks, but I'll do all the other stuff for as long as I can. And it worked well. It was a good partnership in fairness to him. Um, I think, look, he, he, he wants to go off and do his own things in the future. And he sees his opportunities out there. Yeah, no, that's great. It, it sounds like a terrific partnership, and it, it's, it's fascinating how it came about. Um, maybe we could turn just a little bit to the house building business itself. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the secret sauce in your mind for for establishing a profitable uh, leading home builder, and and give us some of the secrets that maybe outsiders of the home building business don't know. 
Yeah, and, and we look at it very differently to to uh, to a few people. Um, we really believe it's all about that the home you build or the product you produce. Um, land has only a certain percentage of that, and I always describe it as the pie with 100%. The land represents 10 to 15% of that. Your margin represents, you know, 15 to 20%. And then obviously the, the middle piece is the big element in the room, um, which is the, the, the raw building itself and, and the soft costs around that. And I suppose that's something that we've really concentrated on more and more. And that's where really our drive is. And I suppose it's very simply, it's just looking at the process involved in building the house and do you require them? And I suppose more and more what we're leaning to, towards is, and this would be the philosophy in the business is that this is more a manufacturing business. And if you can make this a lean manufacturing business, it's raw inputs of land combined with all of that, you, you get out the other end of it, a home. Yes, there's a lot of planning about where those homes need to be located, at what price point those houses need to be at. All of that comes into account. But the biggest elephant in the room to play for is, is actually the raw building of it all. Um, and I suppose our philosophy is, over the next number of years, bringing that mindset to the game where we can actually say, look, instead of having 200 people work on site, why can't we get this down to 30 people on site? Why do we need our auctioneers to visit our show homes at all? Why can't we bring this to an online platform where the customer engages? And I suppose, ultimately, what can we offer the customer down the road in the sense of how do we make our, ourselves different? And I suppose where ultimately we'd like to go is be the one-stop shop. When you visit Glen Vey, you can acquire a home, but we, we can sort out your mortgage. We can sort out your life insurance. We can sort out your furniture pack, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our homes that we built will comply whatever climate change agenda is out there. Bringing all that to work. And I suppose bringing a product that is an efficient in its construction, but meets the everyday needs of the customer. And I suppose that's really where we're striving to go with this. Um, and I think you can see that, you know, we've been able to scale up the business quite rapidly. We've taken from 250 homes or 275 homes to 844. Things were on a great trajectory before COVID. COVID has been a bit of a stumbling block, but I would describe it as a bad pothole on the road that we've hit. It hasn't punctured any tires, but on with the journey we go. No, that's great. And, and so the focus is really on, on efficiency, obviously. And as you say, sort of viewing the business more of a, of a pr uh, production manufacturing and driving efficiencies rather than just building homes um, exactly. anywhere. Um, I, I, on that topic, uh, you, you, I think you have only about 350 people. Maybe it's a little bit different today uh, working directly for the company. The, the rest of it is outsourced to, to trusted contractor partners. Yes. Why do you think this is the best business model uh, for Glen Bay? I think it helps you scale the business faster. Um, so ideally on our direct site, so on a normal development, we would have about 10 to 12 people. So normally you would have all the site management on site and then you'd have obviously an element of, of direct labor and then maybe machine drivers. The rest then is broken into smaller packages that are broken into to packages to subcontractors. Um, we think this is the best model because it helps us scale the business faster. It grows the overall workforce quicker and it de-risks from, from, from a delivery side as well because those packages were never overexposed to one contractor. I suppose the difference with us versus a lot of other delivery partners is they bring in large contractors and to a certain degree they're hostess of fortune to a certain degree and it's interesting like our subcontractor packages we had a lot of pushback from say our plumbing contractors here um, we came in with a different mindset normally in, in, a, in a, an m and &E package the subcontractor the plumbing contractor will supply all the product so he'll supply the labour of doing the house and then he'll supply the heat pump the sanitary etc etc um, but we set up a central procurement department and the reason we did that was tenfold because simply we looked at the amount of units we were going to produce a year, we could bring better buying power to the table. And by us controlling those packages and then letting the subcontractor tap into our suppliers, it, it reduced the cost on an ongoing basis. But the subcontractor, we were never overexposed. We could say, there's the labor, we'll supply all the product, you get on with the service required. There was a lot of pushback, but eventually they bought into it and we're now seeing the success in the business for it. And you also even recently bought a, uh, a, a framing, a timber framing, uh, or built a timber framing. It's the same idea, I suppose. It is, yeah. So we have, yeah, we've, we've obviously a number of ongoing things. So we, we have a factory in Dundalk. It'll be to the north of, of the city. Um, it's about, we bought the, the facility for about 5.5 .5 million in total. Um, and that has the capacity to produce about 1,200 units per annum. Um, this is the first step of it. Um, it's pretty much a simple timber frame factory at the moment, but what we want to do over a period of time is modularize it more and more. So more of the product that will arrive on site to, to, 
a better degree is going to be assembled or will be easy assembly um, and we're seeing the benefits of that you know as the government will ramp up supply here or, or demand supply to be ramped up you know we have the infrastructure in place to, to, to deliver that um, we see this as a space to grow for us over the next number of years um, along with that then we have an inner uh, quarry that, that we acquired probably back in 2018 and there's a couple of big things that are happening in Dublin over the next number of years. The government intend to invest in the Metro North line, which will go from the city centre to the airport. I know a lot of people aren't doing any flying at the moment, but it, it's still on the ongoing and it's going to be a big stimulus for government. And that is going to take all the, the, the capacity that's in the system at the moment to dispose of inert materials. And we're probably the only house builder now that has actual capacity in the system so the things like that it's future thinking where do we need to invest and how can we control the supply chain as much as possible Um, so I'd say we're in phase one of it I think it's going to be a number of phases it'll evolve as things move on but I think it's a big opportunity particularly where we want to scale this business to no that's great and and um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the, just the, the big idea in terms of the house builder uh, model. I, I was wondering, I, I think you've studied a whole bunch of other house builders and, and uh, home builders. And, and I was wondering if there's one in particular, or maybe a person that you're trying to in some ways model or replicate after. Yeah. And I suppose the big one that sticks out to me, well, there's two that stick out to me, obviously. And, and I suppose I look at return on capital employed. Um, obviously you've got NVR in the States. Uh, they're a phenomenal growth stock. Um, they've been a phenomenal machine. They're really, really efficient and the size of the business is phenomenal. Um, and there's others, obviously, in the U.S. I wouldn't be as familiar with the U.S. because, obviously, it's you're not as close on the ground. Um, but, obviously, in Europe and particularly in the U.K., I suppose the one that has stood out, maybe not on their quality, but certainly on their efficiency, have been persimmon. Um, their, their model of, of being efficient on their land purchase, but then at the price point that they're delivering their product. And I suppose I described it to one investor one day. When I look at the price point that Persimmon deliver their product, they're nearly a utility for the government to a better degree. The government needs them more than ever because certainly they regulate the market at the price point deliver, but they dominate at such a scale as well. And I suppose I've just looked at them. Not everything would I replicate? Absolutely not. But there's a lot of their business that I see a lot of benefits. And I suppose they're the biggest, they're probably the biggest now in the UK at this stage. They've weathered every period, you know, they, they never had to do anything in any financial crisis. They weathered through it. And I suppose to a better degree, they're nearly as necessity as food to a degree. They're required and they'll be supported to another degree. Um you talk um, about sort of the industry evolving uh, a, a bit ago. Um, and as an outsider, it seems like, uh, I think you mentioned that people are stuck in their ways, uh, quite a few folks in the industry. Um, what processes and, and technologies are you using? I know now with, with COVID and, and so on, which we'll talk about a bit later, but in terms of technology, selling houses and all these kind of things, maybe you could just give us some insight into how you are, how you are disrupting the home building business. Yeah, so a big a big thing we're rolling out, and I suppose dealing with COVID and COVID came in, and I suppose no one really expected it to be to be the way as it was. Um, I suppose one thing that we had embraced is obviously the engagement on our online platform and and, and showing and marketing the, the houses from there. Just a couple of things quickly, like I suppose what we introduced quickly was was the virtual viewing. Um, now that wasn't new technology, but certainly rolling that out faster certainly got engagement across the board and our order books showed that. Um, the other thing that we introduced just on, on COVID was smart viewing. And I suppose this was a technology basically where we would have our show homes. We would introduce this package. So basically, you could come onto our online system, ask to view the home. And basically, like I'm talking to you here, is you'd arrive up at the home, you'd type in a code, the doors would open, the lights would go on, the heating would turn on, and you could literally walk around the house. And I suppose then we strategically position cameras around the homes. So we didn't physically have to be there with you. You could interact with us online. And a lot of our buyers really liked that because it it actually suited them really well because obviously with with the pandemic, you couldn't do one-to-one viewings um, during lockdown. But the interesting thing was, what we really found engaging was at times people wanted to come through. So say seven or eight o'clock in the evening, maybe the kids are put to bed and people want to go out and view a house and, and maybe the parents come over to mind the children or the babysitter, whatever that was, people could come out and get a freedom. And instead of spending 10 or 15 minutes with a sales agent, they could spend an hour actually absorbing the house and it gave them a little bit more comfort. 
so things like that, absolutely. That was, you know, and I suppose having the ability as being a scale player, but being able to invest that money early versus other competitors, you know, was it an advantage to us? Um, then I think across the business, it's really, it, we just look at it, how do you make this business simple? Don't make it complicated. Take it back to simplicity. And we just look at processes, you know, with the likes of Aconex introduced across the business. And that's a construction management tool where the latest drawings are all uploaded. So any changes that are made are made across the board and it replicates and it, it, it disregards everything below that. Um, and we're seeing the benefits that across the business. The biggest thing we've had to invest in that is actually training people in the skill set to know that. And, you know, you have to have the culture here to do that. And I suppose then somewhere we've been leading is obviously drones. And, and like, I know we get, we get slagged here now and again, but we have our own drone department. Um, and I suppose there was at one stage, there was more people working in that than there was in sales. And people were saying, what are you doing with this? Like, where are you going? I suppose we looked at it this way, very simply. We examined a couple of things. And in fairness, we got a very good guy in here at the start and he was exceptional. He'd done an awful lot of work on drones. Um, and we incentivized them to, to move this on. And, and in fairness, he did. We looked at it and, and we looked at surveying a site. So typically a site of, of 30 or 40 acres, you go in, you survey. It takes people three or four days to do the survey and it can cost up to 50 grand to do it um, because it's all about generating the study afterwards. We were able to bring it back and we could fly a drone over, over our sites and pretty much just at one point, you, you mark out your spot and the drone would fly over. The drone could do it in a day. It didn't cost us very much. Things like that. We've also then adapted to bring the drones on further. So the drones now can fly over our sites once a week. They go out and they fly over the site and they can measure the digs and the, and, and the earth movements on site. So when our QS or commercial team are negotiating packages with their subcontractors or issuing file and payments, they can actually measure. The subcontractor might have his amount in, but because our drone footage has been flying over every week, we can and an measure against that. So again, we don't have to move our QS teams onto site. So we see the benefits of that. We can do our legal boundaries now with, with drone footage because the drones can pick up exactly where the boundaries are and you can mark it out on a map. So you're starting to see all the benefits of that. I suppose then what we've tried to do is look at the technology in our machinery. Um, obviously, we use you know, across the business now, we're trying to push all battery operated tools. So remove generators and things like that. That has made the workforce a lot more efficient because they're not spending 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day dragging generators around the, around the site. Now with battery tools, they become, they get out of their, 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 their vehicle and they get to work straight away. Um, our online inductions are all, all run online. You know, you don't have a person sitting down with, on a one-to-one -one basis. He does it the evening before he goes on the site and he's fully aware of what he does. Um, and then finally, I suppose, GPS on, on, on the big machinery on site. Um, to give you an example of what this is, um, and it probably will become at one stage in the next number of years, I won't be surprised if the driver that's in the digger is removed. Um, the technology is there today for GPS. So instead of having to go out and mark out where the building is, we send the coordinates to the machine, it picks it up and it digs as per the coordinates. But the other benefit then is we can set the dig level of the actual digs itself. So if the subcontractor or the person driving the machine hits bad ground, they can't exceed a depth level unless we give them the clearance to do it. So when you're actually measuring all your digging, you unless you got permission from the business to do it, you couldn't have exceeded a level. And I suppose all of those things are a way of controlling costs. And I suppose that's embracing the technologies that's out there, but it is now starting to move rapidly. And I suppose that's the good thing I see. Fascinating. Um, uh, let's let's turn uh, to the, the goal, and I guess maybe some of what you just said it helps you get to this th three thousand home number. It's it's obviously an ambitious goal. H how do you get there? B besides what you just said with the technology and efficiencies. Yeah, I suppose there's there's a couple of things. First of all, the supply demand imbalance in Ireland is the first thing that's in your favour in the sense of you know this country needs thirty thousand houses or thirty five thousand houses a year. We're building fifteen sixteen this year, obviously with with the pandemic. So there's a huge amount of white space out there. There's a huge market share you can grow into. So that's, that's the first box tick. I think simply what we're trying to do across the business is if you want to scale up to that scale of delivering houses, you need to standardize not only your house, but standardize the processes to deliver your house. And that's simply what we're at day in, day out. Now, has it been as fast as we want? Absolutely not, but it is coming through the system. Uh, I think that's simply looking at it. How many house types have you? 
What's the biggest demographic you can feed that house type into? And then how do you simplify the processes to do that? And I suppose that's an ongoing process that we see in here. And I think it's very simple. You know, if, if, there's, a, if there's a market dynamic out there that wants a certain house type at a certain price point, how do you make that as efficient as possible? And how do you make the process of producing that as efficient as possible? And I suppose that's the real drive in here. So I suppose we don't fear delivering. I know it looks a big number. Um, we think it's just simply replicate the business on an ongoing basis and grow into that. So I think the numbers you can kind of see that is we are on that growth path. Um, and, you know, I think I think over time we'll prove that we'll get there. And, and obviously when you get to the scale, I suppose the real benefit we can see is when you become the scale player, the real opportunity then is what can you squeeze out of it when you get to that size? How do you dominate the position? And I suppose that's really where we want to go. To. Or how do you become the market leader where others can't go? Yep. And, no, and, and we'll talk a bit about the competition in a minute, but it, basically what you're saying is once you get the flywheel spinning in terms of home building, uh, just make it spin faster and more efficiently. Exactly. That'll get you to, to your goal. You, you just signed uh, your first partnership uh, agreement, I guess, in the last month or, or so here um, with the government. Maybe you could talk a little bit about why you're so excited about the partnership business, how you've seen it at, in, in maybe in the UK and, and what's, what's so exciting about that whole uh, part of the, the uh, operation. Mm-hmm. And, and I suppose the big thing for, for us on the partnership side is um, obviously we've done a lot of talking about this for the last 12 months. Um, and I know investors have been very patient to wait to see the first one. But the ironic thing is you do an awful lot of work up front with these projects. You can spend some, like, something like 12 to 18 months to actually invest in this. And we had a team here working on four or five people consistently working on these projects. You do all your designing up front for the product you're going to produce. Uh, you do all your build programs up front. You do all your material specs, et cetera, et cetera, and your pricing. I suppose what's attractive for us is obviously it's going to be a big space. You know, in the recent budget that government announced, they're committed to delivering another 10,000 units of social housing next year. Um, it's a very ambitious program by government to deliver social housing. Uh, there's a huge depth of market out there. The government sees that, you know, there's over 100,000 people on the waiting list for social housing. So it's a huge space. I think the big benefit for us is if, if I simply take the project that we, we've been successful on is, you know, it's a project of 53 acres. Uh, it's in total housing and, and apartments, it's going to be 850 units. Um, we'll have six months to lodge an application when we find, sign the final documents. Um, we'll get it into production, but the build program on that site is going to be quite aggressive. You'll have to deliver it over a four to four and a half year period. So you're, you're going to be producing about 200 units per annum. But I suppose the big thing is the payment for the land section of that, we didn't have to pay for that up front. So we pay on a phase basis. Now it's at a discount basis because Ultimately, 50% of this product is de-risk because it goes back to the state. 25% will go for social housing and 25% will go for affordable space. So I suppose the benefits we see is, first of all, we don't have that big land spend. We get access working with the local authorities and government on that front. And then secondly, I suppose an element, a a large element of the project is de-risk because it's it's sold back to government. Um, And we see the the benefits of really tying it into the two segments that work with the business at the moment. In the sense of suburban housing is going to be in a lot of these developments. And then urban, you know, an element of, of, of apartments is also going to be on this. And I suppose the big thing for us is it's proof of concept. The government are only coming to the table with this at this stage. They've been quite delayed. But the government have committed to the Land Development Agency to deliver about 150,000 plots of land into the system over the next number of years. So this is a big space to play for. And I suppose if you have a proof of concept where you can show to the government, look, we're well capable of delivering this. We can deliver to the scale you want, at the speed you want, at the cost you want. I think that's a huge opportunity for this business to have a natural partner there that can work with it. And I suppose if you look at companies that have done this really well, in the UK, you look at someone like Countryside, where nearly 80% of their business over the next number of years will move to partner with government. So we see this as a big opportunity. And I suppose going back to that return on capital employed, that will be a huge driver of that into the future. And I suppose ultimately, as I outlined at the capital markets, they ultimately where I could see our land bank over the next number of years is if we're delivering, say, 3,000 units per annum, today we have about 14,500 plots of land that we've fully paid for. But over the next number of years, if the partnership business was a success and could take off, we could free up a lot of capital on that side of the business and we wouldn't have to invest in that. So it drives the, re- the entire returns for the business. 
No, oh, that's great. And on, on that topic, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about how, just how you think about capital allocation. I, I think uh, one of our chats, we, we talked about sort of Ben Graham and the outsiders and sort of thinking maybe a bit differently. You, you mentioned the, uh, Justin's um, attraction to the fact that you brought up IRR. So, so maybe you could just talk about the capital allocation generally, how you view it, and maybe your thoughts on, on share of purchases and dividends and the different options, obviously, you have to do with the capital over time. Yeah, and I suppose two things. Like, I think the big thing for us is is making sure that our money is working for us at all times. Um, the business the business isn't there at this moment in time. It's growing into that. It's about returning, uh, making your cash work as hard as possible. Um, I think the ways we look at investing is if we buy a field today, how quickly can we get into that field? How quickly can we exit? And and you know, there's been a focus sometimes on be focused on margin. Well, I actually think you have to look at the other way. If you can turn your money at twice the pace, you can take a lesser margin because you're doing it at twice the momentum. So I suppose that's kind of the focus. I suppose over the next number of years, this business will become extremely cash generative. Obviously, as we made the commitment that we would take 100 million euros out of the net cash position, the net euro invested in land by 2021, we're well on the way to doing that at this stage. And I suppose ultimately, once the, the business has excess liquidity or excess capital, it will return to shareholders. How that policy and, and deriving that, I suppose there's a couple of things you need to, is it a balance between a dividend and a balance between a buyback? I suppose it's for a judgment in a period of time. But I think the most important thing you'd have to do for investors is give them clarity and actually give them a line of sight. If you're heading on that path, how long you'll be on that path and what way you'll do it. Because there's no point, what I wouldn't like to do is, you know, have a kind of, Oh, guys, we found an extra, and I'm only using hypothetical circumstances here now. With 50 million, we're going to throw it back to shareholders. I would actually like to show shareholders a path of a consistent return, whatever way that is made up. And obviously, you've got to look at the futures as well. Is there opportunities where you could expand greater? Is there opportunities where you could expand into other markets? It's evaluating the, 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 the value term of that at that point in time. So it's better not to have a predetermined uh, policy. It's it's better to keep an open approach and and open approach, uh, yeah, yeah open. and value and uh, evaluate your options at that time. Yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about your team. We we've talked about a little bit about them, but maybe you could describe the the culture that you're trying to build. We we've uh, the folks that we've encountered are so far extremely hardworking and and beyond working hard. What what are some of the other elements, cultural elements inside the organization that you've been trying to build? Yeah, so they're an eclectic bunch sometimes I describe them. Um, I suppose there's a good blend. Um, I have to really, I suppose something that I strived for was, first of all, the culture that we want to embrace. We have a huge opportunity in front of us. I want you not to fear it. I want you to embrace it. And that's pretty much, I do, I do say to the guys and the girls sometimes, you will make mistakes. I will not punish you for making mistakes so long as you don't replicate the mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And I think they do, you know, I, I would always like them to lean into it, not lean away from it. Um, and that's pretty much what we would strive to do. You know, it's a very young management team across the board. I know I look into the 50s here or something, but but across the board, it's quite a young team. It's quite dy- dynamic. And the other thing too is I suppose... I often spoke with people and, and I, I go out to meet them and I go out to interview them and they'd say, oh, you have to do it this way. But I'd always look to the people, but you can do it this way. Um, and that would be the thing that would always make me attractive to some of the people that we would have here. There was an element of Bridgedale staff that came, came across the board uh, or came across with the IPO. We've enhanced that. We've brought people from different sectors. You know, we've brought people in from CBRE, people from Savills. Um, and I think there's a very good mix. And I, I think it's a culture of, you know, we can see what's in front of us. We want to go and do it and, and, and get on with it. And I think that's pretty much what you can see. Um, but no, they, they work hard and they like it too. That's the other thing too is, you know, I do challenge them. Um, I do love seeing the, 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 the ways they work against each other sometimes in the sense of I'm going to outdo you here. And, and, and it's good. It, it's good to have a, a, a competitive tension sometimes. It drives people to strive further. So, um, no, it, it, it's a very good mix. Um, and I've been very lucky in fairness to, you know, I have people who are now probably coming up to 10 or 15 years with the business. I've seen how they've grown with the business. And I suppose the big thing for me is trying to get people under them as quickly as possible so they can teach the next generation and bring them with them. So that's very much what I like to do. Like I probably had one of the youngest PMs in, in, in Ireland at one stage, she was 28 years of age 
and he was running one of our largest projects. My view on him was, how do I get other people now in with him? Um, I remember he took on a 33-year-old one. They said, Jade, what am I going to do here? Like, but it was to get it into the mindset, you need to bring the next generation with you. Show them what we taught you, and we can replicate that across the business. And, and that's just that's what we try to do in an ongoing basis. doesn't always work. You'll always find someone that doesn't work out, doesn't believe in it. But, but no, I think ultimately we're all on the same boat. How do you uh, review them? Is there some kind of review process? You, some, you mentioned obviously not your, the batting average is never 100%. So how, how do you deal with uh, somebody when that comes up or, or how is that tracked? Maybe you could just talk about that whole process. Yeah, I, I do watch it. It's interesting. A big thing we're investing in in the business is obviously training. And, um, you know, obviously you've got to get training right at the top level first because if it's not right, it can't flow down. Um, and I do always kind of pitch it two ways. I do ask the manager, what does your team, what training do they need? What do you think? But then I reverse it the other way because I go out to the team and I ask, what training do you need? And it just be interesting to see the dynamics between the manager that's managing the people versus the people that may be under that person. Um, and that tells me a lot of how that person is getting on. I think the business, obviously, the, the, the board sets out the KPIs for the business on an annual basis. Um, it's not just related in, in relation to revenue or margin. It's also about uh, customer satisfaction. It's all about also about health and safety. And obviously, it's good, I think, to have that balance across it because in a business that's quite risky to a degree because you have a lot of staff, but you also have a lot of risk. It's good to have that bill, that balance because everyone's responsible. But I also think too, everyone understands that each department has to work together to make it a success. And I think that's tying that all in together, I think is probably the most successful. But yeah, we carry out reviews on an ongoing basis. We try to enhance. And I suppose the other thing too is we're trying to show career progression for people. You know, you're doing this today, but there's an opportunity as this business scales up that you could be doing this. And it's trying to enhance that and incentivize that across the business. Oh, that's great. Um, maybe we could turn a little bit just to the industry. I, I know we've sort of touched on it through the discussion, but you, you mentioned earlier that, that there's this massive um, housing supply shortage. Why, why is that? Why is the Ireland falling so short on, on building houses? It doesn't seem like it should be that difficult. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a couple of phenomenons. And I suppose you have to remember where Ireland was and where the government was, where regulators were. And it's like everything, um, you know, up to 2006, uh, we were probably building about 80,000 units a year. So as a country, we should be well able to do this. Um, it seems like everything at this moment in time, it's, it's the pendulum swings one way and it swings the other way. It's now starting to swing back. And if we got midway point, it would be very good. It, seem, it is definitely on the right trajectory. Um, I think you have a lot of things. I think you have, first of all, you have a dysfunctional credit system in the sense of supporting builders. Um, I think that's why I really liked the, 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 the journey of having sustainable capital or permanent capital. I can really see the benefits of that. I look at a lot of the competitors that are on the ground and they simply can't get access. If they get access to credit, it's at very expensive money. So that doesn't work for them. And, you know, they're not of the same philosophy of, of how they, they, because they don't have the scale behind them for where we're intending on going, they can't simply get the process in, in, in place. So their cost, of, cost base is simply more expensive than us. I think regulation, ironically, actually hurts the smaller player more than it hurts the big player. And, you know, Ireland obviously came through not only a financial crisis, but the government that was in place looked at a lot of things. It's planning policy, it's building policy, it's building control. And a lot of regulation has been implemented over the last number of years, probably some more necessary than ever than, than, than was required. But the ironic thing is, instead of helping the smaller player, it pushes the smaller player out of the market. But where we do it and where we really see the benefits is, you know, Irish Water is the utility company. You have to deal with all your water connections. We have a team of six people dedicated with dealing them day in, day out. But if I was a player building 50 houses, I'd need one person to deal with them day in. And I have no dilutions of cost there. 
So simply for the small player, that's very difficult. So I think that's been one prohibitor. I think obviously there's been a change in, in this government that has been introduced and housing is a key pillar for what they're going to deliver. They can see where the inefficiencies are. You have things like the macro potential rules that were brought in in 2016 or 2017. That was to prohibit banks from excess uh, credit expansion out there. Ironically, what it's done is it has pushed a lot of people who should be in the housing market. Unfortunately, they've been forced that they can't get into the housing market. Now, the government sees the problems there and they see how they're going to support that. So I think there's a lot of initiatives that are being that are being rolled out. I think this government are really alive to the issues that are in front of them. They also realise they have a short period of time to do this. They need to make changes really quickly. Governments usually survive for four or five years, but unfortunately housing takes two to three years before you see the initiatives you introduce to come through. This government can't wait to two or three years to introduce those policies. They have to act quickly. And I think they are in fairness to them. Um, I don't think land is an issue at all. I think land is not going to be an issue into the future. I think the methodology and how we do things has to change. The industry is moving there, but also the government needs to move into the space as well. That is slowly coming through. So will we get back to building 33, 34,000 houses? Absolutely. It will take time and it will take a journey. The problem for the government is they may not have that time to do that or they may not have that luxury. Some people, some of your naysayers say, uh, just I guess in the industry, not only at Glen Bay, that you know a home, a large home builder in Ireland hasn't happened. It, 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 it there is none up until now, and so therefore it, it can't be done. How do you how do you respond to that? So I think absolutely you can do it. Um, I'd have no fear of it. I think it's simply coming to the mindset of how you should do it and how you're going to do it. I think the other thing too is naysayers that don't want to do it or don't believe it can be done is they're also of the mindset that they shouldn't share the pie with someone either. Um, and that's where the philosophy breaks down. If I look at a, small, a lot of developers, they believe they need to have a large stake in the pie, but they have no pie at all. Whereas I'd be of the belief a small share of a really big pie is better than anything. Um, and they're not of that mindset. And, and that's their biggest problem. Sharing that is really difficult. So the ambition of building that and I suppose to a certain degree, they are happy to knock us, which is fine. I think where we've come from it is, if you want to do this and you want to do it right, you need to structure it this way. Um, and I think that's the benefit for both ourselves and Kern. So, so sharing the pie, it can be done as long as you share the pie and build it, build it together. Um, it, it sounds then like you see the Irish market sort of following a similar path to the UK, it just maybe slightly delayed. Is that right? I think probably, yeah. I, I think if you look at the fundamentals in the UK, there's a couple of fundamentals. Obviously, there's the dominance of the PLCs. Obviously, they're the dominant player in the market today. Um, I think the, the PLCs, what they've done really, really well is they've given a path to government what they need to do. And in fairness, their government have followed a lot of those steps. Um, the other thing that the PLCs in the UK have really shown is their, their discipline in land buying. Um, probably not in the previous crash, uh, they got overexposed, but definitely all the way through this, they've done that really, really well. And the land market has been really controlled to a certain degree in the sense of the input cost of it coming in uh, today hasn't really changed as much as, as it would in previous cycles. So I think it's been that discipline. I think they've been so focused on the return on capital, particularly the really good operators, they've brought that discipline to the table. I think Ireland is probably 10 to 15 years behind that space. Um, so where they were, say, in 2012 or 13 or 14, we're just moving to that space now. I think both ourselves and Kern bring that to the table in the sense of we understand how we evaluate how we look at a piece of property and, and you kind of say, look, this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> I've seen land buyers who have, have said, you're mad. No, it won't take that. I've seen them having to be run out of the building to say, that's not for us. Good luck, get out. Um, and you have to bring that. I remember I stood up to one developer one day and I remember the guys were all in the room and this was a pretty heavy developer in the day, was very well respected. And we were buying a piece of land off him. And basically he came in with a list of demands and I said, there's the door, get out of it quick. And the lads were kind of astonished. You can't be serious. And I says, absolutely, lads. If you don't stand up to him now, he's going to bully his way. And ironically, three days went by. He rang me up again. He says, I'd like to come and see you again. I says, don't even waste your time. Not interested. Unless you've come to the mindset, I'd like to meet you. We eventually got to a deal. We wrapped it up in six weeks later. But you just had to bring them to that point. And I suppose it was an education for the guys in the room as well. Guys, remember who you are here. 
remember the position you have to protect and do it that way. And they did. And in fairness, that's being rolled out across the business now. No, that's great. Um, maybe, maybe you could just touch on, I, I suppose I could have asked it at the beginning, but on Ireland itself, um, you know, many people think that it's still sort of a potato farming, agricultural economy. Um, you know, I, I think uh, if I'm not wrong, roughly 10% of Google's global workforce is based in Ireland, either directly or, or indirectly. Why, why is Ireland itself so attractive to you? Yeah, and I suppose there's, there's a number of things when you look at Ireland. Um, and, and Ireland has changed. I, I suppose the biggest change for Ireland has been, and you have to look at it this way, the European Union. Um, simply going into the European Union opened up mass markets for Ireland. Um, having that federal structure to a better degree, broad Ireland, you know, having the single currency has been a game changer. Our 12.5% corporate tax absolutely has been a benefit to Ireland. And the attraction of, of the multinationals, you have Google, you have Amazon, you have Facebook, you, you name them, they're here. Um, and the interesting thing is sometimes I describe Dublin as a bit like Seattle or San Francisco. Once one comes, they all follow because they all work together. And the interesting thing is they all rob tax talent from each other. And that's why they're always located in a hub together. Um, and that's been the big expansionary thing about Dublin is the IT, when you see it, what they do and how they do it and how they interact um, has been, you know, you can really see that. I think other sectors that have really been, you look at our pharmaceutical industry, it's on a phenomenal growth path and it's been a real benefit to the economy overall. And I suppose the big thing is, and, and it always, as I say, every action causes reaction. We made a massive investment in education 10, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, you've seen the benefits of that coming through the system. I think you look at our population dynamics, we're an extremely young population. We're a growing population. You know, we've, we've probably one of the fastest growing populations in Europe. When I started working first, you know, our population was was 50% below where it is today. And you can see that trajectory. We've also been a welcoming society as well. You know, social the social fabric of the society holds really well. When you come into Ireland, you're not only welcomed, but you are here to stay. You know, one of our, our largest growing populations is, is the Polish, pop, Polish population. They came here in 2005 and 2006, but has, it has grown over the last number of years. And you see that across the board. And I suppose where Ireland ultimately could get is, you know, I know it's an open economy, but the benefits you have to look on the other side is it's an English speaking economy. When Brexit does eventually happen or whatever stage it does happen, um, Ireland has to surely see benefits. Yes, absolutely, there's things that are going to be hurt, but there's also upside you can see there. I think Europe has changed its mindset as well from where it was to where it is going. In 2008 and 2009, it was all about debt control and, and controlling things and to a certain degree, Germany telling the rest of us what to do. The whole different change versus this pandemic is Europe realizes the issues that happened all the way through the crisis and has changed its mindset. It now needs to invest in its economy. It needs to bring its economy and its society to the next generation. And I suppose a couple of things are to the fore is obviously climate change. Everyone realizes what climate change is and what it's going to do. And Europe is in that strive. We need to invest, and here's where we need to invest. And to a certain degree, the shackles are being thrown off, and here's how we're going to go about it. So I think all of those, if ironically what I would say is, I can see all the benefits for Europe because it has its mindset where it's going. If I was to look at Britain, I can't see that far at this moment in time. It is heading in the opposite direction. Yep. Uh, what, what about coronavirus? We, we didn't talk about that earlier. I meant to. Um, what, what's going on today? It's out to here in the States. Uh, home building is booming. The, the housing builders are at their high. Um, sounds like maybe sales are booming in the UK and, and over there as well. What, what's, what's, how, is the, how is the industry uh, responding to the crisis and, and what are you seeing? Yeah, so I'd say I'll, I'll deal on the sales front. Um, and obviously, we have that supply demand imbalance, which, which is obviously now greater than ever. Um, I certainly think the government trajectory and, and, and the positivity around the government has been a positive for the housing market and giving a clear and decisive message. Um, I think the ironic thing about, and I know this might sound a bit, housing to a certain degree has been left behind for the last 10 years. Um, people, to a certain degree, didn't believe in it. They didn't believe in about buying a house. They believed in renting a house or, you know, the, 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 the view was, let's spend our money freely. We'll go on our holidays. We'll go on our trips. We'll do all the, the nice things in life. 
the ironic thing is COVID has woken the customer to how important having their own home is. Um, and what we're seeing on the buyer front is people who probably sat on the fence for the last four or five years was a renter in the market has now suddenly become, I am a buyer, I need a home because my home is not only where I live, it's now where I work, it's now where I entertain myself. It's everything to me. And the investment has gone across. And the ironic thing is what you're seeing across the housing entire markets now is probably in continental Europe and the US is not only are people now investing in new homes, but they're also renovating their homes. Um, and that's the phenomenon. And you're seeing that in the US, but you're also seeing it here. People are now seeing the value of their home in every front. And I suppose that discretionary spend that went into taking travel, going to hotels, uh, you know, going to pubs and restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, has taken off the table and has now only been invested in one front. And that is the home. And obviously IT to support that. Is it is it a sustainable trend? And also, have have you guys thought about changing the the uh, design of a home, maybe to incorporate bigger home office or something like that? Yeah, and that was the thing that we, I suppose, what we concentrate concentrated on was obviously the affordable end of the market and the product we could supply. Um, I think, ironically, most of our stock lent it. Now, a couple of tweaks here and there, and the home is quite adaptable for what people's needs are out there. Um, like the biggest thing that we're seeing across the board is. People want to buy a three-bedroom or four-bedroom home. That's the main goal for them at the moment. They need their own certain amount of space, but they also be, want to be in a community. And like the big thing we're seeing is just on some anecdote of evidence is they're not buying in, say, it's an independent decision. They're talking to their friends or they're talking to their colleagues. So it's nearly kind of a herd mentality to a certain degree. It's not one person coming from Google. It's three people coming from Google. We're actually seeing that in the rental market as well. Like we're presently renting out a, a, a certain amount of stock and we're seeing that same thing happening in the rental market as well. Um, do I think it's here to say, I think, I think the pandemic did something to awaken people's love affair with property again and owning in their own home. I think they've realized how important it is to them now. Um, and I think you're going to see that feed out over the next number of years. I think it is sustainable because I think the good thing for us is we are not where we were in 2005 or 2006 at that supply dynamics. And I think that's the biggest thing we need to watch. Interest rates are coming down to an all-time low. Interest rates are still high in Ireland compared to a European average, but they're on the right trajectory down. I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, everyone is concerned about unemployment and, and things like that. The unfortunate thing about this pandemic, it has probably affected the most vulnerable in society to a certain degree. It has affected people on low paid jobs or on unsecure jobs. Um, and that's the ironic thing is, and that's where the governments are going to have to step in and support those people as much as possible. And obviously the Irish government ramping up social housing will take care of an element of that. But that should spread across Dublin. Whereas when I look at the majority of our customers, their job status hasn't changed. Their pay circumstances hasn't changed. The only thing is they're not in the office five days a week. That's the biggest thing. And I think that's the market that we're feeding into the moment. And obviously Ireland having such an IT exposure has a massive demand for that. Oh, absolutely. It's been a boon for them. Um, what, what is your vision for Glenvay for the next de for a decade from now? If we were doing this again in 10 years, what, what would you be in other countries? Obviously, you talked about partnerships and, and those kinds of things. Maybe you could just paint us a picture of a, a Glenvay a decade from now. Yeah, and I suppose that's, that's our ambition that if, if we can come to a system where our production of our house to a percent, you can't get the entire product mobile, but where a large element of it can be produced mobile, that gives us a huge opportunity. Um, certainly there's a lot of white space, as I said earlier, to go into Ireland. You know, there is the potential then if, if we are a success here, is there other markets that may be attractive to it are attractive to our model? I think there is. I think we need to get conquered here first to make sure we get it right. Um, but it's look for the right opportunities. Where does our philosophy, where would it match in with what we do? How could we manage it? You know, and obviously as, you, as you'd move through markets, there's obviously, there's potentially language risks, there's different regulations. You need to take all that into account. So I suppose over time, it's certainly something that we'll examine. Um, I think we've plenty of road in front of us here at this moment in time, but, but certainly I wouldn't put it off. It's just picking the right market and what could we grow into? What could we do? 
And, and relatedly, what, what, is there a certain metric or how do you think about uh, as you grow over the next 10 years and hopefully more, what, what do you, besides obviously returns, is there a certain number or figure or how do you, how, how would you deem the company a success in, in 10 years or whatever amount of time? Very hard to do that, um, particularly when you're a founder and CEO, you're not sure how, how you give the correct answer. Um, I think for us is, I think the most important thing for us is, if I was to look at it and if, if taken from mind, mindset, how can I create a sustainable business? How can I create a business that is sustainable and can evolve to what will be in front of it? I think that would be the biggest thing of what I, I want to achieve. Scale, is it 3,000? Is it 5,000 units? It's really what is sustainable? What can this business grow into? I think that's really where I suppose my ultimate goal would be is how sustainable is this business? How does the product evolve over the next number of years? And can that, can this business, you know, I, I look at someone and I know it's not, I look at Amazon, what they've achieved in their space, what they went out 20 years ago to achieve and said, here's how we're going to go about it. They went about it by monetizing it to a way that no one else could do. When everyone else was chasing margin, they chased no margin, they traced market share. When they became the dominant player, then they squeeze, they could squeeze it over. And I suppose in the same way, and to a degree, we couldn't live without Amazon today. That's the ironic thing. Whereas if you said 10 years ago or 20 years ago, we can't live without bricks and mortars. Ironically, look how it has evolved. And I suppose it's getting to that position. You know, you just got to make sure that the culture evolves to that and what can we do. But I suppose house building and the house product itself, it's probably one of the last frontiers that has yet to be conquered. You know, the product you could deliver to the customers and the ways you could deliver that product could be in for some huge change over the next number of years. I, I was going to ask you about that, um, and I, I met you earlier. What, what about these startups in California, the, the modular homes and the pre-builds and all the terminology? Um, is that how, are you going to participate in that? I guess to some extent you already are, but how big, a, is that a threat for you or an opportunity or how do, how do you handle that? No, I think that's an opportunity. I think there's a lot of people who have started Modular or, or tried to start it. Um, I think a couple of the UK developers tried it themselves and failed. Um, not failed, but in the sense of it didn't work for them. Um, they couldn't find efficiencies in it. Um, I think ultimately the ways, and this is what I always say about Modular, to do Modular, you need to standardize your product. You need to replicate as much as possible. That makes it simple. Um, then the other thing too is what a lot of modular failures has been is they go in and look, sorry, they go from the outside in, in the sense of they see this is how the product has to look from the outside. So let's say when you actually have to come from the other side and say, what fits into modular from the inside and then go out. Um, but certainly I see it as a space that we can go into. Do you have to get to total volumetric as in three, uh, 3D volumetric? I don't know. I think there's different aspects you can look at. You can look at the supply chain. How can you manage it as it arrives on site? Because ultimately it has to be moved on site. And I suppose the biggest thing is it's that transportation of the product. How do you move the product? Because that's the biggest thing. you can. Do. So I think there's a lot of ways you can do it. I think timber frame for us answers the immediate question. The other thing you've got to look into is what is going to be sustainable into the future? What is, you know, climate action, carbon taxes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, does your product have to evolve into that? And like I, I do, you know, I do give our sales team that they don't make this enough of an issue. The house we produce today is an A3 home. You know, you look at a house, sorry, A2 house, a house that produced, was produced 10 or 15 years ago. With the energy efficiency and how far we brought it, the, the utility cost for a second-hand house versus a new house is nearly 60% today. Um, hmm. But customers don't realize that. So there's a lot of things you can bring to the table. I think there's going to be certain things there uh, that you can do over the next number of years. But the space isn't totally defined yet for us. As you say, it's one of the last frontiers, uh, I guess, to be... To awesome. be uh to be changed. Um, maybe we could end on, on sort of a more personal question. You mentioned, I think you're 41. Uh, you still have a, a very, very long runway. Um, you, uh, you know, what, what is obviously continuing to build Glen Bay, but, but on a personal basis, what is your sort of big dream to, to, to build this and, and then just keep going? Or maybe you could talk about your, your views on that. Yeah, I suppose it, I, I would have said, uh, you know, at, at the start of all of this, that being in the public markets and seeing the companies that were in it would have been daunting and, you know, I suppose I came from, I left school quite early. The ironic thing is I learned more as, an, and every day I come in, I realize it's a school day. 
I thought two or three years ago, I knew everything. When I look back, I knew nothing. And I learn and learn. I suppose that's the thing, is the day when I can't come in and I see I can't learn more is probably the day I should move on. Um, but as I said, I suppose what I want to do is, you know, it's, 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 it's create that business that's sustainable, make a difference to everyone, not only the shareholders, but society as a whole. I think it's a huge opportunity. I think, as I said, the housing market and the house production is probably one of the last frontiers that can move on um, or, or can change dramatically. And I think that's something that, you know, I really get you know excited about, but I think that's, that's a space that we can really grow into. So I think that's kind of, you know, I'm not, I'm not ego driven, certainly not. Um, what I would like to do is as I hand it to the next generation, they can bring it to the next leap. And I think that's that's something that I would certainly like to. But I think there's a huge opportunity out there at the moment. All the tailwinds are in the right direction for us, I think, at this point in time. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. We really appreciate taking the time. This is presented by Vanchap Capital LLC for informational purposes only. The future-looking statements and opinions expressed herein do not necessarily represent Vanchap's views and opinions and may over time be proven inaccurate. Vanchap may or may not manage securities positions of the issuers discussed in this presentation. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation for an offer to buy any security. Vanchap does not guarantee the accuracy of the information provided herein, and this presentation should not be the basis of any investment decision.